hammer uh, is our only tool, and if you look at the problem, then of course you know that every problem looks like a nail. Um, and my current hammer is forensics, so when I was talk asked to talk about networks, I have two options. I either talk about network forensics or a forensic network. I don't know anything about either of the two topics, uh, so I pick the one, and uh, hopefully I will uh, be able to, to share some of my ignorance. So that's our agenda, that's what I'm doing, and uh, I'm, I'm beginning to, to try and give slightly less linear talks, not, so, not quite there yet. So you can see the variety of fonts there, and uh, my idea is to eventually jump between topics and exactly where I am, you'll hopefully recognize them from the font. And you can see the old English font there that's supposed to give you some background, some history, so it's for old English. Uh, some forensics, that old font, I don't know why, uh, some fiction, I, I, I think the, the font looks like a story, and then some important stuff, uh, that's really what I want to say in a bit of a more script-like font. Now, if we start with forensics, forensics, as I've already said, is what is intended to establish the root cause of an event. Uh, very often it is used in criminal cases, and the challenge, or one of the challenges of forensics, is to find evidence that met or that can be used in a court of law that will be accepted by the judiciary as proper evidence. Uh, it all started with our old friend, the uh, Archimedes. I guess most of you know the story. Uh, if you do not know it, a uh, uh, hero of Syracuse gave some gold to his goldsmith and asked him to make, I think it was a crown. And uh, when he got the crown back, he thought that he was cheated. He thought that there was some silver mixed into the gold, that he didn't get all his gold back. And he then asked Aristotle to, uh, or rather Archimedes, to, to figure out whether this was indeed the case. Um, now the problem was that Archimedes couldn't just destroy that crown, he couldn't melt it up and see what was going on. And then the story is one day when he got into the bath and he saw the water displaced, he figured out that he could calculate the density of the crown and he could then weigh the, the crown and figure out whether it corresponded to the density of gold. Turns out that he did not and the theory of Syracuse was indeed cheated. And uh, that then is the first case of forensics that we know about. Uh, a lot of people doubt the story, uh, but uh, let's not go into that. We won't let the facts interfere with the story. Um, next story there, uh, next picture there, uh, I put up the name there, and hopefully someone can confirm that that is indeed some cheap or something like that. My Chinese is non existent, uh, but in about 1248 he wrote a book. And the name of the book was, uh, uh, and again it's in Chinese, Zhi Lan, Zhi Zhuan Li, uh, that translates, according to Wikipedia, to uh, washing away of wrongs. And he tells the story there of quite a couple of cases that have been solved by forensics. Uh, and it's uh, one of the stories is the following. Uh, there, there was someone who was murdered and uh, the investigator then took a number of possible weapons and he tried them out on, on some animal carcass and eventually worked out that it was a sickle that was used to kill the man. And then he asked all the workers to bring their sickles and put them all on a piece of ground and they waited. And eventually the flies settled on one or settled on one particular sickle. And obviously that means there was blood on that sickle and the person was guilty or was found guilty. Um, slightly more modern story, and this and the English people here will hopefully be able to confirm this. This is Wells Harbor in Norfolk, and in about 1782 it sold it up. And for some reason, it was taken to court. And uh, on the one side, they had a lot of expert witnesses who measured all sorts of things about this particular harbor. 
From the other side, we had a Sidney Johnson, you know, a civil engineer. And the civil engineer was asked, uh, not asked, he, he testified. And in his testimony, he used um, Newtonian physics. And this was a huge issue. He used Newtonian physics that he didn't reinvent himself. He didn't have any experience of this. Uh, they accused him of using hearsay because he used this theory. Um, and uh, to the idea to use something that didn't really relate to the case as such, uh, rules of physics, uh, was quite new. In the end, the judge said that he learned quite a little bit of that and he accepted the testimony. And this is really the first case where testimony was accepted in, in the court. There's another story um, in the Old Bailey, uh, 1957, uh, which I think is one of the, or in the High Court in the United Kingdom. Uh, the judge there uh, was, was hearing a case about murder and there was some expert testimony. And he, the judge then remarked that it's quite peculiar that expert testimony was used to prove a murder. Uh, in the old days, when you just see that someone was killed, and now suddenly they had expert witnesses. Uh, another old story, 1784, a person uh, was killed, uh, it was a certain uh, Edward Coleshaw, or Cole, yeah, Coleshaw, uh, he was shot. And when they examined his body, they, they found a web of newspaper in his head. Now, if you think about how those old pistols were loaded, well, you put some powder into the pistol, and then you put the, the bullet in, or the ball, and then you had to put in something to keep that bullet in place. And the something that was used was a lot of newspaper, and they found the remainder of that newspaper in someone's pocket. Uh, someone was John Timms, and John Timms was found guilty of the murder. So you can see that a lot of this goes back quite a long time, but a lot of it is not necessarily forensic evidence. It's not necessarily something that would be uh, accepted in a court of law in general, and in particular, a lot of it is not general rules, the sort of things that you would send routinely to a forensics lab. Um, so, if we bring things to more modern times, then you see a picture here, the person in front, uh, Edmund Lockhart, a uh, Frenchman who in 1910 asked the police in Lyon to give him two rooms for a forensics lab. And he was given that room, and uh, from 1912 onwards, the wood done in that lab was accepted as scientific evidence. And this is really the origin of forensic labs, of, of forensic science to, to a, a great extent. Um, uh, as time went by, a lot more evidence was introduced. You've all seen the stories on, on TV where the various people bring the various experts and basically fight about the various experts and the question then became, how do you know what is allowed in court and what is not allowed in court? Polygraph is a famous example. Do you believe it or don't you believe it? Does it work or does it not work? And um, uh, this, uh, not really funny, but uh, cartoon uh, shows what is, has been happening. Uh, your science sure looks impressive, but the word on the street is that you're kind of a quack. And judges had to begin to exercise much more of a gatekeeper function to decide what to allow into court and what not to allow into court. Uh, many countries have developed certain rules to decide what is to be allowed in and what is not. The most famous set of rules is arguably the, the Dabera standard that is used in, in the United States. Um, now, Dabera did a couple of interesting things. To some extent, it opened up the field to, to allow more evidence in, uh, but it 
also closed down the evidence, or so that the judge really had this gatekeeping function. And you can go and read the whole history of that there if you're interested. Uh, amongst others, uh, the judges really started doing some philosophy of science to figure out what science was. And uh, if uh, you're interested in, in uh, philosophy of science, they more or less accept the popish view of, of science. Uh, but uh, if you read between the lines, they were not quite sure that popular is correct. And then they find some other rules as well. So uh, this is where we are now. There, there's a gatekeeping function. What is to be allowed in? What is not to be allowed in? And uh, we take it from there. Now, a fairly recent development is the development of digital forensics. Something that brings it a little bit closer to a uh, when the field really emerged as an academic discipline, perhaps six, seven years ago, uh, we were, a lot of us were talking about computer forensics. But the term digital forensics is now gained general acceptance. And uh, as you can see there, it's basically any sort of device that stores information in digital format that we use to, or that we can examine, whether it's a normal PC, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's a PlayStation or hard disk or whatever, any digital evidence that can be examined. Uh, our, one of our problems when we talk about network forensics, going to our topic of today, is what is network forensics? Forensics is one of those useful tools where, uh, as a researcher, you can stick it onto absolutely any term. We are here at a conference, and I can probably call the term conference forensics, and I can probably base an academic career on it. The question is, what is network forensics? Do we need it? Is it anything special? Is it different from any other type of network, or what type of forensics? And you can see that I have a whole array of things there, some of them that are obviously not useful. Picture in the bottom right hand corner was sent to me by one of my students recently. Probably not entirely clear there, but the, the subscript or the, the heading there was catfight, which I thought was a very, very nice description of, of what's going on there. Um, now, what do we do with network forensics? What is the challenge? What is it all about? Now, uh, as uh, I've done with forensics, if you want to talk about networks, I probably should give you a history of networks as well. Uh, but since you're all in the networks field, I can give you that five seconds. Um, you know, it all started with Alan Turing, and hopefully most of you know that Alan Turing has been dead, uh, would have been 100 years old a few weeks ago. Uh, there's, a, there's a very nice conference in the United Kingdom one of these days uh, which will be celebrated. Uh, he wasn't really into networking, but of course he needed computers to start it, so to get it all good. Then one of the next big events, the internet, that's the original internet or ARPANET uh, picture that I guess most of you have seen, the original phone of the ARPANET. Uh, then Vinton Sur came along and uh, Evolved the internet, so that more or less what the myth says. Uh, eventually, we had a little cloud that was known as the internet and all sorts of stuff connecting to the internet. And this is where we now, where everything has disappeared into a cloud and we live in with a cloud. So there are your 10 second uh, background uh, on network use. Now we can turn our attention to, to forensics. Uh, and one of our problems with forensics, digital forensics in general, is that it's ephemeral. Things disappear. If you think where the evidence sits, the evidence may be in RAM. The moment you switch it off, the data is gone. It turns out that it's not really gone immediately. You can do all sorts of things to recover a little bit of it. Uh, if it's on a disk, then it may be there for 10 years or longer, but eventually that disk is going to forget what it had on it. Don't know how many of you still have those five and a quarter inch floppy disks, and how many of you have recently tried to read them. I still have a batch of them, and I still have a five and a quarter inch reader. 
it seems most of those discs have forgotten what was on them. And even if they do not forget on their own, then someone can quite easily delete the information. Now, if that disc-based information is ephemeral, then, of course, what is on the network is even more ephemeral. It just disappears. It's on the network for a moment, and um, the next moment, it's gone. And if you blink, you miss it. So, let's now go on to a little story. A uh, little story, if we want to talk about forensics, the figure that comes to mind is probably our old friend that you all know. Was Sherlock Holmes a good forensics investigator or forensic scientist? Remember, he interpreted evidence like no one else could. And the problem is that he wasn't really a good forensic scientist at all. He was a good investigator. He could work out all sorts of details, but generally speaking, the uh, rules that he used to, to deduce or have to use his uh, conclusions uh, wouldn't hold up in court. Unfortunately for him, once the, the guilty parties were found, most of them confessed, and of course once they confessed, it's easy, you don't need forensic evidence. Now, when we talk about digital forensics, people tend to jump to some process. And there are lots and lots of these processes. And I'm going to show you the one that I use most often. There are all sorts of flaws with it. But I think this one is simple, and for a talk like this, it's probably the easiest to use a simple scheme. So what you will see there is when they talk about digital forensics, they typically in some preparation phase, then there's some acquisition phase in which you get the information, then it's an examination phase where you figure out what went wrong, and then there's a presentation phase where you tell the court whoever else may be interested in what you found. And we look at the preparation phase, first of all, for normal forensics, there are all sorts of things we can do to prepare for a forensic investigation. The simplest example is probably the black box that you will find in your banks. Uh, now you probably know that those black boxes are neither black nor look like a box. Uh, but those things are installed in a plane and uh, they do various things. You can see on both of these at the bottom they are made of flight recorders and are open. The one on the left bottom end is the one that was in the France plane that uh, went down about two years ago. Uh, so, in, in the real world, we do prepare for forensics by, amongst others, installing devices that will record information as we require. Uh, in the digital forensics case, preparation very often refers to getting the right sort of equipment. On the left, you can see a kit that has disks that you can use to image drives to, to copy the data off. In the middle, there's X-ray that is commonly used to, to damage cell phones. Uh, amongst others, you can see those cables at the back there that are used to connect to any cell phone you can imagine. And the X-ray can then generally take all the data off it, all your call records, you can record all the SMSs or uh, well, everything that is on the cell phone. And then FTK is one example of software that you can use to analyze this information. Um, there is a somewhat more questionable approach. Uh, the things that you see there are keyboard loggers. Uh, generally speaking, we encounter these in, in, in uh, criminal contexts. It's what people install when they want to eavesdrop on our communications, in particular when they want to capture the passwords that you use. And as you probably know, they've been found in all sorts of strange places. Amongst others, they've been found in banking vaults, where the banks provide a facility for people to do internet banking. And one day someone looked at the back and they saw that someone plugged a keylogger in there, and that keylogger was recording all the passwords and login information that people would store. 
important enough. The question is if we want to do digital forensics, is it ethical to go and install something ahead of the time and record whatever is typed? Because then you will have the evidence when it is necessary. I'm going to try and answer that question. Of course, there are all sorts of legal ramifications that I'm not going to, to go into. Now, the problem is when we get to our topic, network preparation, how do we prepare for network forensics? Clearly, we will get devices and things to examine logs and so on. Uh, do we enable normal logging? Yes, of course, that's necessary. Without normal logs, it's, it's very, very hard to figure out what's happened. Do we do what I call exhaustive logging here? Do we capture everything that is captured on the network? If you go and look at the internet, you will find some papers where they argue that that's exactly what you should do. That it's possible to capture everything on the network. I think it's becoming harder and harder as your various devices are no longer with you as they are in the cloud, for example. You have your email server somewhere and you have your backup server somewhere. You don't know where they are and the, the email is back up to that backup service. You, you can't generally get into that or onto that connection between the two and capture everything that happens. Uh, now the possibility is to do adaptive logging, to, to only capture what is necessary. And all of the above ties in with eavesdropping. Can you eavesdrop now? Again, all sorts of legal ramifications. In general, there are laws that prohibit you from just eavesdropping. But if you are busy with a forensics investigation, and you have the right court order or whatever else you need, then you can indeed capture traffic. And in terms of preparation, we probably then should only have the right equipment to be able to do it. You can't just start to capture indiscriminately. If you look at the acquisition, the physical case, we know the story in the physical world, you pull it off the uh, crime scene, you make sure that nobody gets to the crime scene. The problem is contamination. You do not want the evidence to be contaminated, and that's the key phrase. Um, also, what you do is you bag and tag the evidence um, so that you can maintain a proper chain of custody and know exactly what has happened uh, to this evidence since the point where it was taken or where it was acquired. Uh, in digital acquisition, we have our disks and everything that we need to acquire. The other tool that we need, or you know, that is commonly used, is some device that uh, prevents the disk again from being contaminated, from being written to. So you can see that there are two things that are called no write on the one and drive lock on the other one. And they are simply write blockers. Uh, you install them between your capturing device and your disk that you want to image. And that device ensures that nothing is written to the disk. So again, contamination is excluded. Uh, bottom left-hand side, you can see a cell phone that has been placed in a Faraday bag. Uh, you don't want to switch the cell phone off because it may lose valuable information. But if you leave it on, then the criminals can come in and they can change the evidence on the cell phone if it's been set up to accept incoming connections. So put it in a Faraday bag and it will not communicate to the outside world. Uh, some sort of a message digest like MD5 is commonly calculated so that you know that the evidence is not being tampered with. And bottom right hand side, the physical disk or whatever you have imaged is still collected in, in the good old way. Uh, network acquisition is in the problem if or the, the question is anything special there? Do we just use some sort of a sniffer, or some sort of a protocol analyzer uh, to, to collect everything? Uh, how do we know that it's not been changed? Because on a disk at least you can go and calculate the MD5 and for the MD5 uh, uh, you can check that the MD5 on the disk corresponds to the collected evidence. But on the network as the traffic comes through you can't really copy it and calculate the MD5 and make sure that what you have on disk is the same as what was on the wire. So how do you ensure the integrity? How do you know that it's not been tampered with? 
is there any way to bag and tag it without really knowing, uh, without any doubt? Uh, question also, do you capture everything yet again, or is there some sort of adaptive acquisition? Uh, and then the examination, well, the physical world, this is usually what we see. Blood spatter analysis, some DNA testing, uh, bottom left hand uh, corner you can see ballistics that we were looking at, two uh, rounds that have been fired, and they look at the scratches or the striation marks and they see whether they correspond. In that case, they do correspond, so they will figure out that the, both of these rounds have been fired by the same gun. If the one has been fired in the lab, then they know what gun was used and therefore they know what gun was used to fire the other one. There is an autopsy and uh, there is also forensic dentistry where in the lab they compare bite marks with uh, teeth imprints. Uh, something to note here is that all of this takes place in the lab and in general what we get out of this is something that we will probably call the truth. If you look at something like DNA analysis, then we know that there's an error rate, but that error rate is tiny. So if your DNA has been found somewhere, then the implication is that you've been there and there's no question about it. Now, in, in digital forensics, we have these two columns that I have here. The one is the theory. Um, and there are a couple of people who have begun to work on what they say is the underlying principles, things that can lead us to the truth. Cohen, for example, works on what he calls information physics. What are the rules that apply to information? And then from that, he uses what is indeed the truth, something that you can stand up in a court and say, I've used the scientific method, it's all based on information physics. And uh, therefore, whatever I deduce is the truth. Uh, whether that works is still open for debate. Uh, I don't have time today to, to go into any detail there. And there are a couple of other people, Bloody Chef, for example, who worked on uh, using finite timer and carrier used on formalization of the processes. What we have in practice are a lot of people who are doing, for example, file system forensics. And they call data from file systems. Now, uh, if you go and call data, then it means you find files that perhaps have been deleted, files that are fragmented, and you know no longer have the links between the various fragments. And from all of that, you figure out what the original file was. A lot of us who come from a technical field love to do that sort of thing. The question is, is there any science behind that? Or is it just us being intelligent? Is it just our opinion? Is, is there a scientific basis for that? Uh, operating system forensics. A lot of it, for example, deals with the registry in a Windows system. And if you see traces in the registry, you say, OK, I know what that means. Does it really mean what it purports to say, or is it something that has been faked? And we don't really know that. In cell phone forensics, we get poor records and so on. Again, question that they've been tampered with. The one thing that is easy enough for us to do is contraband. Uh, if you look at almost all the real cases out there, or not all, uh, a very, very high percentage of real uh, digital forensics cases, is where they found contraband. And the, the bad example in all cases is basically child pornography. If they found that on your disk, then you're guilty. That's easy enough uh, to, to show that at least you are in possession of it. Now, in, in network examinations, the question is what do we want to examine? Uh, if we don't know what we want to examine, then it becomes very, very hard to do network forensics. It's hard to do a bottom up uh, 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 discovery almost of network forensics. Uh, there are a couple of examples of things that happened. The Internet Worm 1988 uh, was one of the first cases where a worm spread around the Internet, rolled down the Internet. Uh, its analysis was quite interesting. 
But of course, they, they weren't really examining something on the wire. They were looking at code that was deposited on some disk. So it's a network forensics. Uh, the LinkedIn password theft that occurred three, four weeks ago. Uh, again, what happened there? How was the information obtained? But yet again, the question is, was it really network forensics? Or was it operating system forensics where they just got a password file? Uh, many years ago in South Africa, we had the APSA bank app. Uh, app. Uh, APSA is just a big bank. And what happened there is that uh, someone emailed some software that was intended for children, for parents to monitor their children, uh, mailed that to people, they clicked on it, it was installed, and it started recording everything they did. And that uh, forced the people to obtain some passwords and hack into the bank or into their bank accounts. Not really a hack, they just got the passwords. Again, is that the sort of thing we want to do? Uh, another example, my Google Calendar. Uh, since last week, uh, entries in my Google Calendar have just begun disappearing. I would look on, at the calendar Sunday evening and I would have a week full of appointments and Monday morning it's empty. It's lovely, but something's causing it. And then you write to Google Help and of course you get some response that doesn't really say anything. They say just read this and read that and so on. I've read it already. So is, is that the sort of thing, to figure out why are those entries disappearing in my calendar? My, my, my theory is that it's one of my devices that I synchronize with it that's deleting it. And I would love for Google to just tell me what is deleting it. Is it an I something or is it a Symbian something or whatever? But apparently they can't. So there, there's no evidence that I'm getting at. But again, with all of this, there's a question, are we talking about scientific evidence or is it something else? And then finally, the presentation phase. And I argue that we can't really talk about how to present it if we do not know what we are really examining. But let's go back to the fiction. The story that I've been telling you is a story that some of you may know. It's the poison belt. So Arthur Conan Doyle. So it is not too far away from uh, 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 Sherlock Holmes. Uh, it's Professor Challenger who learns of this poison belt through which the earth will be moving. Uh, uh, he invites his friends over to his study. He seals them into the uh, into his study with, uh, with oxygen tanks. Uh, when the oxygen runs out, they open the windows expecting to die, but nothing happens. Uh, they look out of the windows and they see all these dead bodies outside. And they then go on to investigate what is the case, what has happened. Uh, but then after a while, the dead start waking up. Uh, actually, they've just been asleep. They've been asleep for 24 hours. And they continue with their business as if nothing has happened. Those who were playing golf just continue playing golf. Those who were in the horse courts just continue the horse courts and so on. Um, and then the challenge that Professor Challenger faces is how do you convince these people that they've missed 24 hours? How do you convince something, someone or something they've experienced without them having experienced it? Uh, and this is where the quote comes in. One person drives down the hill and Professor Challenger asks him, have you no remembrance of anything remarkable as you came up the hill? And so uh, he begins to figure out that there were some funny things, but it's still a long way from figuring out what happened. And to, to a large extent, that is what we have to do in network forensics. We, we've missed, in all likelihood, the actual event, and somehow we have to work out what happened. So we are we left with these two options. We, we should either be prepared, as Professor Challenger was, and sit in your study and, and observe what's going on, or you should learn from the aftermath, from the logs and the damage that has been done and so on. If you look at the research done in, in digital forensics uh, or network forensics, you can see my Google Scholar search there uh, led to about 32,000 papers. So it seems that it's a very, very active research field. But if you begin to look at it, then most of it is classified in four themes. The one is where they say, okay, we've been doing intrusion detection.
fiction for a long time, but now digital forensics is our new topic, so let's, let's just relabel it. And we're going to decide what to capture the moment we see an intrusion. And they use that to either determine what to log, uh, and uh, very often they use artificial intelligence for that. And then we can begin to raise a whole lot of questions, and I was looking at the time, I'm not going okay to raise those questions, but things like error rates, whether AI will be able to find unique crimes, things that are not a pattern, and then fairness, whether it will find criminal evidence and exculpatory evidence, or incriminating evidence and exculpatory evidence with the same probability. Theme two that emerges is collect as much as possible. And all sorts of architectures being developed. How do you collect, how do you instrument, how do you ensure that uh, you get all those information, that nothing is lost? But that really is a, is a uh, preparation in a certain sense. There, there, there's not much being learned from that. Team 3 is log correlation. I haven't put anything below that, but log correlation is one of the interesting you have different clocks on different machines, then the logs are not properly in sync, and how do you put them in sync? I mean, there may be some missing interest. I think there is a field where we are seeing some science being done, some real science. Uh, a lot of the work deals with process models. Then people are beginning to say, first you do that, second you do that, third you begin to do that. And again, there's a question about science, how do we know that those process models are correct? Or do they, do they just fit in with what we've always been doing? Is it just common sense? And I'm not going to try and answer that question, but I think there are some good questions about it. This is typical of what happens out there. Here's a book, Mastering Windows Network Forensics and Investigation. If you look at the table of contents, you will see that a lot of it deals with just plain old stuff that has been around for a long, long time. And... Um, Eventually, uh, what is it? Chapter 15 of the book deals with forensic analysis of the data block. So, old stuff with just something new plugged in. Uh, there's another book. That book uh, talks about what do you expect to see in email headers? What do you expect to see in website headers? What do you expect to see in web search? How do you fake them? How do you forge them? And so on. I think that's very really useful on a practical level. So I think there is some real work, but again, is that forensic science, or is that just a, a, a common uh, common knowledge of how systems ought to behave, and once you know how they ought to behave, you can create evidence in whatever way you want to. I don't want to use this opportunity to sell our work. Uh, we've done some work uh, to isolate information, we've done some work to... Uh, uh, isolate things in the cloud and so on. Uh, I think there are all sorts of interesting opportunities in the cloud. Uh, amongst others, can we build forensic clouds? We move the evidence to a cloud that is trusted to examine the evidence. Um, so, what have I done? I've done exactly what I have accused a lot of the other people of. I've taken a lot of old stuff and I've put in a couple of questions about forensics, about network forensics. I don't have, have the answers. Um, I, I think looking at so many of the papers out there, they don't have the answers yet. And the answer is the one to the question, what do we want to get from network forensics? Is there a reason for network forensics to exist? I think there's a lot of opportunity if we can find the right question. I know some of you have been working on it, obviously I haven't read all 32,000 papers that I've found, so there may be some interesting work out there. It's just my experience that so much of what I encounter rehashes all the work and do not really add anything to forensic science with an emphasis on science.